way discipline from child rearing, they do not work. They do not work. All right. This morning, my purpose is to make a case in general for the necessity of discipline in all areas of our lives. And if you're not a parent this morning, well, then this will still apply to you because discipline is an essential part of all areas of life. Government, education, economics, business, uh, bureaucracies, volunteer service organizations, ordinary neighborly relationships, social relationships. In every area of our lives, there is supposed to be, God intends for there to be some form of law and order because God says that governors do, are his ministers to prevent anarchy from, from prevailing. Anarchy is the result in society and in homes of failure to exercise proper discipline. Our culture is rapidly, rapidly moving away from biblical standards. It already has in key areas. Uh, our government has passed legislation that uh, eliminates capital punishment. Capital punishment is a biblical standard. You know, you take a life, you lose yours. That's biblical. And uh, yes, human government is frail and faulty and sometimes misdirected, but the pain and anguish and the financial cost to the Canadian public since that law was passed far outweighs mistakenly taking the life of one or two or three or four or five or even a dozen individuals over a dozen years. Because many more people's lives have been taken as a result of criminals who should have been put to death being allowed to roam the streets. And uh, we're suffering as a culture because our government at the highest levels have been, is, has been emasculated from its ability to exercise authority over the criminal element. Criminals have as many or more rights than average citizens. And it's very difficult to secure convictions today because of the imbalance in our jurisprudence system. Secondly, um, I, so discipline is necessary in all areas of life. I want to apply this this morning to make a case for discipline and child rearing in particular. I want to isolate the arguments against discipline that you commonly hear, that some of you probably have thought about or have said yourselves, and I want to challenge those arguments. And I want to reflect this morning, I want you to reflect with me this morning on the fact that God himself is a disciplinarian. And yes, God does never, never makes mistakes. And yes, none of us can ever approach to be exactly like God in this lifetime, but hey, in this fallen world, God expects government to operate. He expects parents to operate even within our limitations and to uphold as best as possible the standards that he has set for the control of sin and evil and rebellion. Spanking has become a big deal in the province of Ontario. Last year, uh, it was a high-profile case. I think it was Peel County. The Children's Aid Society walked into a family's home and took their children from them. I don't know all the details, but... That was a high-profile case, and it's pretty sad <laughs> when Bible-believing people, those are Bible-believing people, had their children taken from them because they practiced spanking. Somebody had an agenda there that was anti-biblical. Right? There are many parents, and, many, and even in churches, that are afraid to discipline their children in public for fear that other Christians in their church might report them. I was talking two weeks ago to a young couple we know from southern Ontario, and they said it's a dangerous thing to discipline your children in public, even at church, because there are Christians who have su developed such an unbiblical, anti-biblical philosophy of child-rearing that they might even report them as so-called child abusers to authorities that can seriously wreck a family by getting involved. And I can guarantee you, if the children's aid gets involved in your family, you will be emasculated, and you will your any authority you have will be ripped away from you as a parent, and you will not be able to exercise authority. You will be merely a figurehead, a toothless lion, and your kids will rule. 
That happens in situation after situation after situation today. And it's, there are legitimate reasons for, for this happening in our culture. There, does anybody deny that there's abuse happening on, on a major scale to poor children in this, in this country? Nobody denies that, right? But we, the reactions to the abuse have swung so far that now parental rights are being abused. I want to establish for you that discipline in general is essential for life. Turn with me to Romans chapter 13 for a moment. I'll quickly read this passage. Romans chapter 13 in the New Testament. And this is a passage specifically on political and social government. I'm a minister of God, and Joel Pavoni is a minister of God. I serve God from the pulpit, and I serve God in my home, and Joel is a police officer, and he serves God in public. I try to reinforce divine law, and I have no interest in uh, breaking uh, society's laws, but divine law rules, in my mind, ultimately, Divine law ought to rule for a police officer as well. But the point is, is that there is law and order in every element of life. Let every soul, this is a biblical mandate, Romans 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. Whoever therefore resists the power resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Now, just a minute. We must define from God's perspective what is a legitimate higher power. In God's mind, a legitimate higher power is an authority that is a terror to evil, as God defines evil. You understand that? Verse 3. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Will you then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you shall have praise of the same. Right? Police services uh, and enforcement officials in the Ministry of Natural Resources and uh, Revenue Canada, CCRA, and uh, every department of government, uh, they all have their enforcement wings. And if you're doing the right thing, those people should never have cause to come to your house knocking your door, right? They should never have cause to do anything to penalize you if you are doing good as God defines it. But we get into trouble in our cultures when our culture turns away from God and all of a sudden defines good as evil. And that's what's happening now. Spanking is, is almost in our culture, not quite yet, but it has almost become defined as unlawful it's not it's still lawful to spank your child with re you reasonable corporal force on your children you have the right in law to do that as a parent in this province but you better not overstep your bounds and you better hope to goodness you don't have an enemy that has an axe to grind and uh, makes a false accusation accusation against you to the children's aid or to the police because boy you run into big trouble fast okay so government is supposed to uphold divine law as God defines good and evil. All right? Verse 4, For he, the higher authority, is the minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God. It says it twice here in this passage. An avenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject. Submit. Not only for wrath also, but for conscience sake. And this includes paying your taxes. Tribute, in the days that the Bible was written, was a very unfair thing. You know, subject peoples were forced to pay monies to, to support the Italians over in Rome. <laughs> to the government of Rome. And they overruled all other peoples under the empire and they forced tribute from these people pay money to us we're Italian pay money that was forced tribute you're a subject people and you know what the Bible says they're in government it's better to pay your tribute than to become an anarchist and take law into your own hands all right 
So, with that as a basis, think, think about the following. I think the ultimate statement I'd like to make in, in terms of discipline is necessary to all areas of life is that discipline pre prevents anarchy. Without powerful, the power of discipline, no authority can function. An authority will only be a figurehead if it is not able to penalize or to punish evildoers or to execute judgment, sufficient judgment, quick judgment. Ecclesiastes says if it's deferred for years and years and years, you know, what kind of justice is that? And it's getting to the place where in our culture a guy can be charged one, you know, on such and such a date and they can go through such a rigmarole that it might be five or ten years before sentence will actually be passed on that particular offense or that particular charge. Discipline is critical to control. Government discipline, governments discipline wayward citizens, employers discipline employees who are insubordinate or don't work, military courts discipline law-breaking military personnel, animal trainers discipline animals, educators have a discipline protocol in schools for wayward students, parents still have the legal right in this country to discipline their wayward children. And that's as it should be. This comes directly from the principles of the Bible. And if you, parent or grandparent or potential parent, think that it's bad to spank your kids, you better think again. You better think again because you have embraced an unbiblical philosophy. Now, spanking is not equal to abuse. And we're going to deal with that later. The second thing I wanted to deal with this morning is that God Himself is a God of law and order and of justice of mercy. God Himself is the ultimate disciplinarian. You can't read your Bible without getting this point. And I think that we need to remember as Christians that God is perfect. Amen? Amen. God doesn't make any mistakes. Amen. And if God deems it fit and right and just and necessary to discipline people in His world, who are you to raise your puny little fist in God's face and say, well, in my area of control, I'm not going to use your ways. You have no right. That's foolish. You have a wrong perception of God. Is God wrong? Well, if He's not wrong, then maybe we ought to imitate His example. God is a disciplinarian and He holds justice as very, very important. And He balances it off with mercy. Okay? Genesis 3. Did God discipline Adam and Eve? Give me some feedback here. Isaiah 14. Did God discipline Lucifer? Cast them out of heaven. The angels, according to Jude and Second Peter, are in chains of darkness awaiting sentence that followed him in rebellion. Genesis 4, did God discipline Cain? Genesis 5, did God discipline every person that was born to Adam and Eve for the next 500 years? Did they live indefinitely or did they die? Read Genesis chapter 5. So-and-so lived so many years, and he died. That's God's discipline. That's God's judgment in action. Genesis chapter 6 through 9, did God discipline Noah's world? It wasn't just the people either. It was the animals. God totally cleansed and scoured this earth. Go to the Grand Canyon if you want to see the effects of the flood. Okay, Genesis chapter 11, when they all got together, instead of spreading apart across the earth... Like God told them, it'd be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they said, no, we're going to stay here and we're going to build a, a, a temple to our God and we're going to worship here in idolatry. What did God do? He disciplined them. He created the language to confuse and short-circuit their designs. In, in Exodus chapter 6 through 12, did God discipline Pharaoh and Egypt? Numbers 13 through 15, did God discipline the first generation of slaves that he brought, that he saved out of Egypt? He didn't let any of those people go into the promised land. He was tough on them. He made them all die, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. But he never let Moses in either. God disciplined Moses. He lost his temper one time in 80 years of ministry, and God said, well, that's it, buddy, you're not going into the land. Was God unfair? God has a sense of justice. Justice is more important just about than any other thing. You read about that in the last chapter of Deuteronomy. Joshua, did God uh, discipline the nations that lived in the promised land? 
There were ten nations, indigenous peoples that lived there. And God brought the armies of Israel and annihilated their animals, their women, their children, and the men. He just, like an H-bomb, just atomized them all. They were, that was his design as his instructions, get rid of them all. The animals were diseased, the, the women were diseased, the men were diseased, the children were diseased because they were practicing perverted sexual relationships with animals, child sacrifice, their mentality was skewed to the ultimate max. And God said, we're going to get rid of this garbage here and now. And that's why God annihilated those cultures. Was God unjust? Well, you take it up with Him. And we go through the Bible. I could spend all morning talking about examples from the Bible. God brought the Assyrians to discipline the ten northern tribes in 722 B.C. Took them into captivity. And, you, and there are remnants of that still live from China to Lebanon. Scattered through southern Russia, Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, northern India. I've seen the movie. The remnants of the Jewish ten northern tribes are living there today. In 586, God brought the Babylonians, ancient Iraq, Nebuchadnezzar I, Saddam Hussein called himself Nebuchadnezzar II, minted coins with his picture superimposed on Nebuchadnezzar's picture, and tried to rebuild the uh, ancient city of Babylon until they just, they just destroyed it last week. <laughs> All his money and effort for nothing. All right? God destroyed, he disciplined people because they were against his laws, rebellious against him. God is someday going to take every wicked person that has ever set foot on this planet and he is going to judge all the wicked. You read it in the second last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 20. It says all the wicked will be raised up, even the ones that had their bodies cremated and dropped into the ocean. If God's big enough to speak a human being into existence, he's certainly big enough to bring all those subatomic particles back together and recreate those atoms and bring that person face to face with his maker and say, now you will answer. And God is not a despot. He is not a dictator. He operates on the rule of law. John chapter 12, verses 48 and 49, Jesus said, Do not think I will judge you in the last day. The words that I have spoken to you, they will judge you in the last day. And when all the wicked are resurrected and stand before the righteous God of the universe on Judgment Day. Great White Throne Judgment, it's called in the Bible. Guess what? The books are open and the dead are judged out of what is written in the books. There are written, There is written evidence going to be brought forward in God's final court that is going to silence every stupid excuse and every supposed defense for every sinful human that has ever lived on the planet. Romans 3.20 says, So all the world will be guilty, silent before God. You won't be able to say a thing. All right. So God has established that in every area of life, Romans 13, government exists. Government is God's mechanism for controlling sin and sinners Authorities must have the power to discipline and to punish. Otherwise, it's no power whatsoever. Anarchy will prevail. That's a biblical principle that's fundamental to every level of society. And now we get particular. God himself is a disciplinarian. He's proved that down through history. We are called, as Christians especially, to imitate our Father. Be ye perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I want you to just review quickly some of these statements in the Bible. I'm not going to reread them, but look at the standards that God has set. God demands that parents correct their children, to chasten their children, not to spare the rod in their children, to take a rod to the back of their children. All right? That's the biblical standard. You can say, well, that was just Jewish. No, it wasn't. Hebrews chapter 12 is for Christians. And God says, no chasing for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And if you read the first ten verses before this eleventh verse, you will discover that God himself is held by the writer of Hebrews as the standard for all of us. And his argument there is, if a father doesn't 
spank his child, that just proves that the father doesn't love his child. How many of you go around spanking other people's children? You don't love them enough to spank them, but I really care about my kids, and I'm not going to let them grow up stupid. And so I'm going to discipline. I'm going to do whatever is necessary to make sure that they get their stupidity driven right out of their little brain and to teach them some wisdom and to learn to respect authority and the power of authority and the words of authority. That's the biblical standard. I'm speaking with a lot of uh, authority this morning because this matters a lot to me. And we see it in people's lives around us every day, the consequences, the real life ruin to children and grandchildren that happens when families have somehow missed the boat. Something's happened there and they never got the discipline. And it's such a total, total shame when Christians who say they believe the Bible adopt secular, humanist, Freudian, uh, Spockian, Principles of child rearing. Did you know I just read recently and I tried to find it in my file and I lost it somewhere. But Dr. Spock, how many have read Dr. Spock's book on raising children or have heard about it? Dr. Spock is the guru, the secular humanist guru of child rearing in this country. For the last 40 years, he's an old, old, old man in his 90s now, if he hasn't died. And I just read recently that in his old age, he went into print and said, there are two things that we have left out of this whole equation, and I admit it. The Judeo-Christian ethic and mo principles of morality and spanking. Dr. Spock said that. Dr. Spock said that. What are some of the arguments that people use against discipline? Well, many people say that to spank your child to use corporal punishment is automatically abuse. Well, God doesn't abuse us, but He disciplines. And God has used severe discipline over the ages, over the ages of time. And in this country in this country and in this specific province, in the province of Ontario, there are still elements of the ancient Judeo Christian ethic Christian ethic that was basic to Ontario jurisprudence and legislation at one time, hundred and fifty years ago. All right? And it is still parental right to exercise corporal punishment. If it's a if it's Abuse, it wouldn't still be in our laws. Okay? And in that respect, our, our provincial law still uh, illustrates and supports divine law. Other parents say, well, I don't spank my kids because I can't trust myself. I'm afraid I might abuse them. I might lose my temper. Well, then, you need to learn self-control. Self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you don't control yourself, then you better make that the number one goal for your life for the next 24 years as an adult. Learn to control yourself. But self-control <coughs> presumes that there are moral absolutes. What is control? What is something that's out of control? You yourself have a conscience that God has placed within you. You know when you go too far. I have gone too far as a parent in disciplining my children. I say that to my shame. But my children still love me. And I have admitted to my children there are times when I have done it. And sometimes I went right back after I did it and said, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that to you. And you know, that resolves the problem for the kid. They won't grow up dysfunctional if you fail as a parent. Right? They'll forgive you. Kids are really forgiving. They love their parents. All right? It's too bad parents don't love their children enough to discipline them. So Christian parents need to, all parents need to learn self-control. You need to consider the alternative effect on your child if you follow this philosophy of no spanking through. If you choose not to spank your child because you can't trust yourself, you know what you're going to do to your child? You're going to let that child think 
that there are no rules, there are no absolutes, there are no authorities that must be obeyed, that child will grow up to kill himself or somebody else. He will spend his life in prison or get killed by some other criminal in the law of the jungle. You better not use that false excuse that you can't trust yourself because the alternative is horrendous. All, all hitting is bad. Spanking leads to violence and teaches kids to, to hit back. Yes, you're right. Sometimes it does. When parents are out of control, when parents are perverted, when parents are uh, have unregulated aggression when parents are drinking and on drugs when parents are so self-oriented that kids are a nuisance to their lifestyle and they don't want them around yes when they hit their kid they are modeling a behavior the kid is going to imitate the kid is going to be hostile aggressive unloving controlling uh, dictatorial mean violent yes but you know something that's not only the fault of the hitting. That's all the other stuff added to the mix. If a child is hit by a parent in spanking, when the rod is applied to the buttocks of a child for the child's misbehavior, and it's done in a process, in a context where the, ch where the parent is in control, where the parent is not visibly aggressive and red-faced and screaming, when the child has heard from the parent, go and wait for me, and in two minutes I will be in there, you know, if you, if you are red-faced, then give yourself two minutes to calm down, you know, stick your head in a pail of water, <laughs> go outside and stick it in a snowbank or something, count to 25, and then go in there and have a reasonable conversation with the child and explain, did you disobey what I tell you? Demand an answer. That's a form of the discipline. There's, there's submission there. There's acknowledgement of authority right there. Right? You get the kid to say it back to you. Yes, I was wrong. Did you hear me say that? Yes, I heard you. Did you obey me? No, I did not. Then the wages of sin is death, right? Yes. Well, I'm not going to kill you, but I am going to spank you. And I'm going to make it painful for you here. And it's not because I don't love you. It's because I don't want you to grow up thinking that you can get away with murder. You need to recognize my authority. So bend over, put your hands on the floor, and I'm going to give you three on the butt. And it's going to hurt. And maybe that will help you think about it the next time. And so the parent must not let your soul spare for the child's crying. It comes right out of the Bible. I don't like spanking my kids. And I don't like spanking anybody else's kids. And I do that sometimes when I get their permission. All right? But if you're going to do it, it has to hurt. It has to hurt enough to be a deterrent for the next time. If there's no pain, there's no deterrent. The authority, you might as well talk to your kid. And a lot of parents become threatening, repeating parents as a result. Because they have no authority. The child knows it. And so they... Ah, 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 stop me, do that. Ah, ah, ah all day long and the kids just tune them right out and it doesn't work okay so hitting is not the problem it is hitting with a bad attitude it's hitting without being controlled as a parent and it's hitting without knowing the process that's involved in discipline from start to finish I've learned a lot in the last five years and I've been married for 25 almost and I've had kids for 24 and you can learn at any juncture in your parenting odyssey. And I've learned more in the last five years about parenting than I have in the 23 before, or the 20 before. And I'm thankful to God for the resources that He's given to me to learn by. This stuff that we've got here is just excellent stuff. So hitting is only bad when the parent is unrestrained, hostile, aggressive. But it is not bad if it's done under control. Uh, some people say, well, I tried it and it didn't work. No, you didn't do it. You didn't try it. If, you, if it didn't work for you, you didn't try it right. And you didn't follow through and you were not consistent. You didn't learn how to do it from an expert. So find an expert to train you how to do it. I'll talk to you. Dave and Kathy will talk to you. Watch the videos by Mike and Devil Pearl or get the book and read it. James Dobson. Where's the resources here I've got here this morning? In the late 60s, James, James Dobson, who is an expert on child training and teaching and 
and dysfunctional problems wrote this uh, classic work on child discipline, balancing out love with control. <coughs> parents that lose control lose their kids. But some parents will not control their kids and shower them with love, and where does that lead? Ungrateful little wretches that don't respect authority, and they get themselves in just as peck of much of trouble as the kids that are abused. So there's got to be some kind of a balance here between showing your kid you love them and controlling that kid with discipline. He discusses it at length. It's an excellent book. The next, the sequel to this was um, The Strong-Willed Child. Right? But this needs to come first. Strong-Willed Child needs to come second. And then Michael and Debbie Pearl's uh, books on training up a child, how to train a child, volume one, volume two, volume three. There are three little booklets like this that you need to get. I'm telling you, if you're a parent, you need to get those and read those books and weep for the opportunities that you have missed in training your children. It doesn't boil down to beating your kids every day. It boils down to taking your parental responsibility and making it the priority in your life that God meant it for be. Forget entertainment. Forget your own lifestyle. Forget making money. You don't need to have lots of money. You need to have a godly family. You only need enough to pay your bills. You need to become rich or famous. So learning contentment on the part of the parents, accepting responsibility, taking charge of the children I brought into this world instead of letting the devil and his henchmen raise them in the school system, I'm telling you, those people will wreck your kids by and large. And if you're such a bad parent, or if circumstances have led to the Children's Aid Society getting in control of your children, you've just about lost the situation. You've just about lost. Right? And I believe that God can do miracles. We need to pray for people who get into that situation. We need to be making ourselves available to be a support system for people whose kids are out of control and whose hands are tied by the Children's Aid Society. We need men. We need older young guys in this church to make themselves available for male role models for kids in our Awana clubs and in our Sunday schools. That's a crying need right now. We need that right now. Never mind big brothers. It takes six months to get your name on the list. Okay, And if you want to serve God, man, I'm telling you, there's more work cut out for you than you can handle right now just by being making a friendship with a needy kid who doesn't have a dad or a needy kid that doesn't have a mom. All right? And so you men and women uh, need to be thinking about this. Here's one that we need, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more tonight. In defense of biblical chastisement, Dave said to me last Sunday when he gave this to me, or he, when he came up to me after church, he said, if I ever got hauled into court for spanking my kid, I'd take this book in and read it to the judge. <laughs> right? And I read it, and I agree 100%. All right? And so tonight we're going to show one of those videos on child training and, and discipline uh, by Michael and Debbie Pearl. We'll have this available. I'll be reading excerpts from both these books tonight after Breaking the Bread at 6.30. I just want to challenge you as parents to realize that we live in a culture that has not run that many of the principles and philosophies and practices in our culture are not run by God. Ephesians chapter 2 says the, the age in which we live, the course of the age is dictated by the devil. Lost people are against the Bible in general and so they listen to man's ideas and philosophies. Psychiatrists and sociolo sociologists, feminists, people who are anti-family, who are stacking the social services today and certainly don't believe the Bible and who are anti-spanking. And it's these people that are making the laws and enforcing the laws and controlling children out of dysfunctional homes. And somebody's got to do it, right? But it's a shame that we're losing control. The church is losing control big time in this culture. And so it boils down to individual persons, Jonathans and Steves, and families that are willing to, you don't even have to make a big deal about it, just make friends with somebody you know is having trouble, some single mom. Make yourself available to them. Develop relationships with those kids. 
make a major time investment in there, develop a relationship so that the kid gets some security and knows that somebody loves them. But you've got to hold them accountable. There has to be discipline. Right? Now, there's more here to talk about than I have time to talk about in a 45-minute message. I'm already almost 55 minutes here this morning, so we're going to quit. But I hope I've stimulated some gray matter and challenged you to think about the, the, the standard that God sets for families. Okay? And if you're not disciplining your children, or if you're, you've raised children, adult children, not to discipline their children, you need to take stock and admit your error and go back to the standard of the Bible because it doesn't work. Your way doesn't work. Only God's way works. Father in heaven, there isn't a person in this room that doesn't struggle with discipline issues in our personal lives. We all are undisciplined as individuals. We have a tendency to be lazy, to kick back, to avoid responsibility, to let somebody else do it. And democracy, somebody wrote, is only as good as, is only, only works when people are disciplined and moral. And that's why our culture is going downhill so fast, because by and large, uh, people in important places have, in too many important places, and uh, Joe Populus has let go of a sense of responsibility, of a, of a belief in moral absolutes, of rights and wrongs, and have lost heart in a willingness to stand up and make their voice heard and to insist that people live by standards that you have set. We need to encourage people in government who are enforcing right and um, confronting evildoers. We need to pray for them in whatever field of service they find themselves. It's a very, very difficult job. Parenting is difficult. But we need to embrace your standards, Lord, if we want to see success. In Jesus' name, amen.